decay around opsonized erythrocytes covalently attached to a polylysine-coated glass surface. Activation of the complement cascade present in human serum creates a gradient around these cells. DIC images of neutrophils during chemotaxis and phagocytosis. The playback is at real time. The erythrocyte has a diameter of about 5 microns. The neutrophil migrates toward and engulfs the target in a manner similar to that of phagocytosis of a free particle. Note these features of neutrophil migration. The cell is polarized with a leading edge of pseudopod extension and a tail which is retracted as migration occurs. The cells migrate at rates of 5 to 10 microns per minute in these chambers. Here is another example of neutrophil migration. Observe a lobe of the nucleus near the leading edge of the cell as it migrates. As phagocytosis occurs, granule deposition appears to occur on the surface of the erythrocyte. This granule deposition is more readily apparent at high magnification and slower playback. As neutrophils migrate on the surface in these chambers, repetitive transient increases in cytosolic free calcium concentration occur. During phagocytosis, these transients continue to occur upon an increased baseline cytosolic free calcium concentration. A paper describing these transients is in the January 1990 issue of the Journal of Cell Biology. To examine whether these transients occurred within localized domains inside the cell during chemotaxis and phagocytosis, we used image processing of Fura2 loaded cells. At the beginning of each sequence, note the red O, which, which shows the location of the erythrocyte target, since it appears only for a few seconds at the beginning of the sequence. Blue in these images corresponds to low cytosolic free calcium, and red is high. The playback is shown in real time. During chemotaxis, but before the neutrophil makes contact with the erythro erythrocyte, no persistent localization of increased cytosolic free calcium is apparent. We see neither at the leading edge nor at the rear persistent and continued localizations of high cytosolic free calcium. About now, the neutrophil makes contact with the target. No immediate change in cytosolic free calcium is seen, but a few seconds later, the cytosolic free calcium concentration rises rapidly, and within two seconds, it has risen several hundred nanomolar throughout the cell. Note that during this rise, transient localized microdomains of very high cytosolic free calcium are apparent. These microdomains may represent sites of calcium release within the cell since they appear in a given region only very transiently and last for usually less than a second. We have performed a variety of control experiments that indicate that these localized regions of high calcium are not an artifact due to dye sequestration. We have also shown that they are not artifacts introduced during image acquisition or image processing. Release from such small regions may be responsible for the transient increases in calcium which we have observed using whole cell photometry recordings, these transient increases are irregular in nature and are always observed in migrating cells. The images we're showing have been updated six times per second, and the uh, ratio images are therefore uh, obtained with fairly high spatial and temporal resolution, as, as can be seen. These images are re reported also in a special edition of the journal Cell Calcium, which will appear during 1990. A second playback of this recording is shown at three times real time. At this speed, the impression of localized release and diffusion is more apparent. During this playback, one can notice how distinct regions of very high calcium appear and then disappear. The cytosolic free calcium concentration increases rapidly and then decreases somewhat, and then rises again, this time somewhat more slowly and to a lesser extent. Here's the secondary rise. And the cell continues to have high calcium as phagocytosis proceeds. This neutrophil has already touched the erythrocyte target. Cytosolic free calcium concentration is high throughout the cell, and transient microdomains of very high calcium are readily apparent. As engulfment of the target continues, the cytosolic free calcium concentration remains elevated at approximately 250 nanomolar throughout the cell. This is a consistent finding in neutrophils. During phagocytosis, the baseline cytosolic free calcium concentration is elevated compared to the level seen during chemotaxis. Although in the two cells which we have shown so far, there is apparently no region of high cytosolic free calcium localized to the periphagosomal region, in roughly two-thirds of the cells we have observed, we did detect such regions immediately in the adjacent to the uh, phagosome. Examples of such localization will be shown in the video playbacks of the next two cells. 
So here we see in this cell there is no persistent localization, but calcium remains high throughout the cell as phagocytosis proceeds. During this process, there appear to be continuous localized release and apparently reuptake of the calcium, which, con which gives this heterogeneous appearance. In this cell, the erythrocyte target is slightly fluorescent, which allows it to be seen during the playback. Note the region of high periphagosomal cytosolic free calcium, which becomes apparent as the cytosolic free calcium rises. We'll stop the playback momentarily to allow one to more readily see the high region of calcium immediately around the phagosome. As phagocytosis continues, the calcium level then declines, as can be seen here, where there are no areas of high calcium. And then it slowly uh, rises again. In the secondary rise, the localization is not so apparent in the immediate area of the phagosome, but is actually higher, more or less, throughout the cell. So again, we see uh, localized microdomains of high calcium, which appear and disappear transiently, with, in this case, only some orientation towards the phagosome. In this next cell, a calcium wave is apparent, which is spread from the periphagosomal region in the front of the cell and down into the tail. About now, you can see the wave starting to propagate down the tail. This wave propagates through the cell at a rate of about six to seven microns per second. You can also note that the localized periphagosomal regions have high calcium, which is actually fairly persistent in this cell. Also note the tail of the cell, about now, calcium is starting to go down, and this, actu this reduction in cytosolic calcium inside the tail actually precedes a retraction of the tail, which will become evident in, in a few seconds. So now calcium has started to go down inside the tail, and right about now the retraction of the tail begins. This, the fact that the contraction occurs after calcium has gone back down again is indicative of the fact that a high calcium is not immediately required for producing the contractile force which pulls the tail back into the cell. In fact, as will be seen later, we think that calcium may be required for releasing sites of attachment. We will now play this back at three times real speed, which allows one again to see the calcium wave propagating down to the tail of the cell and the increased levels of calcium in the immediate vicinity of the phagosome. We were then interested in determining the significance of the cytosolic free calcium transients since they occurred in every migrating neutrophil which we ever observed. To do this, we made DIC recordings of cells migrating under different conditions of altered internal and external calcium. Just as a reminder, we will now show images of what neutrophil migration usually looks like in these chambers in the presence of external calcium. As the neutrophil engulfs the target, the tail is smoothly retracted. Once again, note how the tail moves smoothly with the rest of the cell. As engulfment occurs, tail retraction occurs. Here's a cell which you saw previously, played back once again. This cell is a good example of the apparent smoothness of tail retraction. One condition of altered calcium which we looked at was the chemokinesis of calcium depleted cells in the absence of extracellular calcium. In this condition, cytosolic free calcium is reduced to less than 10 nanomolar as measured in separate experiments using Pura-2. As you will see, these cells are unable to migrate in response to the chemoattractant present in human serum. Although these cells are still capable of repeated pseudopod extension, they remain stuck by an attachment to the substrate. The cells can extend pseudopodia, but they are then retracted towards the center of the cell. This anchoring is especially apparent when a thin veil of cytoplasm is present, such as in this cell. In the next cell you'll see there'll also be such a thin veil of cytoplasm. This cell will make repeated attempts at migration, extending pseudopodia, but will fall back upon itself, almost with an elastic effect.
No calcium depleted cell ever migrated in the absence of extracellular calcium, and the same inhibition could be reproduced by simply omitting external calcium from the medium. It was then necessary to determine whether this inhibition was the result of altering internal or external calcium. To distinguish between these two possibilities, we examined the migration of cells calcium buffered with high concentrations of Quin2 or BAPTA in the presence of external calcium. Calcium transients were significantly damped in this condition. A variety of migratory behaviors were observed, which may correlate with the different extent to which different cells were calcium buffered. Some cells did not migrate, although others did. Although somewhat fewer calcium buffered cells migrated, what was most striking was the decreased velocity and altered morphology of migration which was observed. These studies of the requirement for calcium transients in the migration of adherent neutrophils were also published in the paper in the January 1990 issue of the Journal of Cell Biology. In agreement with others, we have found that even calcium depleted cells are capable of migration on albumin coated glass and other relatively non-adherent surfaces. The surface of our chambers is coated with polylysine and its serum adhesive glycoproteins. These provide a substrate upon which calcium transients appear to be required for the continued migration of the human neutrophils. So we think that the, the nature of the attachment to the substrate is what uh, provides the calcium requirement, the calcium transient requirement for the motion. We're currently investigating the biochemical mechanisms which govern this attachment and deattachment in these cells. So in summary, we find that calcium transients occur in migrating neutrophils. No localization of increased cytosolic free calcium is detected at the leading edge of neutrophils during chemotaxis, although a transient periphagosomal localization is apparent in about two-thirds of the cells during phagocytosis. Calcium transients appear to be required for the migration of human neutrophils on an adherent substrate. We would like to acknowledge funding support for these studies by a grant from the National Institutes of General Medical Sciences and also by a Medical Scientist Training Program grant to NYU School of Medicine. In addition, we thank Dr. Mary Elizabeth Hatton and Mr. David Smith for their help in making the DIC recordings, and Drs. Bronick Pitowski and Joseph Mickel for many helpful discussions on neutrophil motility.